I bring greetings to you, worshipping in the sanctuary, greetings in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, and greetings also to those worshipping at the concert hall at our Shine Forth service. And we continue in our sermon series through John Wesley's sermons in our Connect experience. Now, as you heard the scripture reading, work out your salvation. I don't know what, you come, what, what comes to your mind when you hear this phrase, work out. Maybe you think of these. Yeah, you can see on the screen people exercising, working out. Uh, you, you're, you're kind of know me by now, right? You know my kind of humor, right? So I've been trying to actually come up with some new jokes. <laughs> Thank you. I haven't told a joke yet, but you're already laughing. Thank you. I've been thinking of new jokes about people who don't exercise. So I've been thinking and thinking, you know, people who don't exercise, what kind of uh, jokes can I make about them? But sadly, none of those that I thought of actually worked out. <laughs> you all got the joke, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Children, if you don't get the joke, uh, later you ask your parents, okay? But today's Bible passage, well, obviously it's not about working out in the physical sense of physical exercise. But it does have to do with exercise in the spiritual sense. And we'll talk a little bit about that as we go along in the sermon. But at the start, I want to point out something that's interesting about this text. What's interesting is not uh, the question of uh, that, the, the fact that we do have to work out, but what's interesting is the question of who is exercising, who is the one working out, who is the one working. We heard in the scripture, work out your salvation for it is God working in you. Who is working? In fact, there are two parties that are working that we see from this Bible passage. God works and so we too work. I want to quote John Wesley from his sermon. He says this, God works, therefore you can work. God works, therefore you must work. And this very uh, punchy quote from John Wesley, I think it sums up this passage very well. The key point, that there are two sides, two sides of this very same coin. God works and we also work. So let's look at each side of the coin in turn. The first side, God works. It is God who is at work, the Bible says. And we can unpack this with a few questions. First question, why is God working? Why is God working? Well, God is at work for His good pleasure. God works because He has a good purpose. When God works, it is aligned with His good plan. It's not really about our benefit or our pleasure, our security or our comfort. It's not really about what we want but about what God wants. And what does God want? Well, whatever plans, whatever purposes God has for us, we can be assured that they are good. God is at work always for His good pleasure. His plans, His purposes are always good. Second question, where is God working? The Bible says God is working in you, in all of you, in us. I think this is quite amazing. If you think about it, God is the creator of the whole universe, every atom, every molecule in the universe. God created it. God oversees, God superintends all the laws of nature. God can work out his purpose, his will, his good pleasure in any way he wants. He doesn't have to do it through us. But the good thing, the amazing thing is that God doesn't work independently of us. The Bible says God is working out His good pleasure in us. That is God's grace. That is a privilege that God gives us that we can share in His work. I think that's quite amazing that God is working out His good pleasure and He does it in us. Third question, how? How is God working in us? This is the obvious one. God is at work in you, enabling you both to will and to work to will and to work. Again, two sides. And we'll look first at to work. God is working in us to work, that is to do, to act, to accomplish. In one sense, this is simple obedience. 
Right? We see this at the very start of the passage, verse 12. Therefore, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed. By the way, you see on the slides that I've uh, struck out the word me. Uh, in our NRSV version, it says, just as you have always obeyed me, as in obeyed Paul. Paul is the apostle writing this letter to the church in Philippi. But actually, in the Greek text, this word me is not there. And so many other English versions, they simply say, just as you have always obeyed. And so really, our Christian obedience is not primarily to people, not even to uh, great people like the apostles, like Apostle Paul. Our obedience is ultimately to God. What is obedience to God? Obedience to God is really a manifestation of God's salvation. Obedience is God's salvation visibly displayed for the world to see. Now, salvation is not just something uh, idealistic. It's not just a concept. Salvation is not something that God gives to us to hide away secretly in our hearts. No. Salvation is something observable. God is working in you. God is working in us to turn this concept of salvation into something actualized, into a visible reality. Obedience is the showing forth of God's salvation. And I want to say that obedience is not something we do to earn or to merit salvation. We obey God because we have already received His mercy, His grace. Obedience is a natural result of salvation. It's a natural consequence of being saved. And so when we say God is working in you to work, to act, to do, to obey, this is to show forth the reality of his salvation. But that's not, that all, that's not all that God is working. God is also working in us to will. And to will, that is to uh, want, to desire. The word will here in this text doesn't uh, refer to uh, willpower or resolve or determination. The Greek word here is quite a common one. It simply refers to what somebody wants what we desire. God is working in us to will and to work. But I want to say that in our culture and our society, we often emphasize more on the work part. We focus a lot on our behaviors. Right? So uh, there are many children worshipping with us this morning. Children, you know in school, right, you are uh, being taught how to behave well. Your teachers teach you that. Your parents teach you how to behave well. And rightly so. But children, I want to tell you, when you grow up as adults, you will still be taught, but in a more subtle way. And all of us adults, we know that society also teaches us subtly how to behave. We learn as we grow up how to behave in ways that are uh, perhaps cool or charming to make ourselves feel more popular. As we go into the workforce, we learn how to behave in front of our bosses. Uh, by the way, I need to say uh, hi to my boss. Hi, PIC, Pastor Wendy, uh, over at Shineforth. I'm behaving myself, okay? <laughs> That's what society teaches us, how to behave. Even when we go for seminars, we go for, uh, listen to motivational speakers, we listen to TED Talks. At the end, there's always this thing called the call to action. It's about what we do, what we act, how we behave. But what if... What if it's more than just about our behaviours? Have you ever prayed? Have you ever asked God to change not just your behaviour, but to change your desires? Have you ever asked God to change not just what you do, but to change what you want? Now think about it. Is it not the case that what we truly want, we will end up doing? What we truly desire, that is what we will work towards. What we truly long for, that is what we will accomplish, that is what we will realize, that is what we will actualize. What we really want, that is what we will do. And so we can ask God to change what is it that we really want. There's a Christian professor of philosophy. His name is James K.A. Smith. He says it well in his book, You Are What You Love. Uh, can I invite us to read this quote together? What if you are defined not by what you know, but by what you desire? 
Our wants and longings and desires are at the core of our identity, the wellspring from which our actions and behaviour flow. Isn't it true that our desires, our longings, our wants are at a very core place in who we are, a very core place of our hearts? And more than a thousand years ago, St. Augustine, he also wrote something similar. He says, when we ask whether somebody is a good person, we're not asking what he believes or hopes for, but what he loves. Our culture has taught us how to behave well. But do we deeply desire to be good? Do we really want to seek God's good pleasure? Do we truly long to please God? Do we genuinely want to love God with all of our hearts, want to love our neighbours as ourselves? That which we really want, we will in fact do. And so we can pray, we can ask God to change not just our outward behaviour, but also ask God to reorientate our inward desires, our inner wants and longings. Ask God to refine, to redirect. What is it that we truly want? What is it that we truly love? Throughout this Connect experience, we've been repeating this phrase, that your soul may prosper. In fact, you see this on our slides. It's at the uh, bottom right-hand corner of our slides every weekend. And of course, Pastor Kaiming, he opened this whole CE series with the question of the soul, explaining about the soul. And so I ask us again this morning, what does a prospering soul look like? Well, one aspect of a prospering soul is a soul which wants what God wants. A prospering soul is one which loves what God loves. After all, God himself is the maker of our souls. God himself is the love of our souls, the lover of our souls. And so today I want to invite you, maybe you've never prayed this before, maybe you've prayed it before, but you need to surrender to God once again. And so I invite you, would you ask the Lord, Lord, please renew my will. Please rightly order my loves. Lord, please direct my desires, my longings, my wants unto your good pleasure, O God. And thanks be to God, when we pray that prayer, God hears us, for God is indeed at work in us, enabling us both to will and to work for His good pleasure. We've looked at the first side of the coin, God works, therefore you can work. This is God's enabling grace. Apart from God's grace, we can't do any of this. But let's now look at the other side of the coin, the bottom part of this slide. God works, therefore you must work. Sorry, that's on, that's on the top part of the slide. God works, therefore you must work. And one Bible commentary says it clearly. The priority of God's work does not vitiate our responsibility to work. We are not puppets on God's strings. We are fully responsible human beings, obligated to continue to work out our salvation. But you may ask me, Pastor, why does the Bible say work out your salvation? I, I thought salvation is a gift from God. We can't earn our salvation, right? Yes, that is true. Salvation is a free gift from God. There's nothing we can do to earn or to warrant or to merit God's salvation. And that's why the Bible doesn't say work for your salvation but work out your salvation. Right? This one preposition makes a lot of difference. Work for implies using our efforts to try and earn or to gain something. That's not the case for God's salvation. In contrast, work out connotes a sense of investment, investing effort to bring something into fruition, to bring something to its fitting conclusion to see a process through to its final destination, to its intended completion. And that's why we say things like, together we can work it out, or it will all work out fine in the end. Work out has to do with a process. And this also applies to salvation. Salvation is not something that just takes place at one particular point in time. Salvation is also a process. Salvation is both a point in time and a process over time. 
You see on the screen, Ephesians chapter 2, this explains that salvation occurs at a point in time, yes? For by grace you have been saved. This is the past perfect tense. But scripture is also clear that salvation is an ongoing process. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, to us who are being saved, this is ongoing, it's carrying on in the here and now. And salvation also continues on into the future. Romans chapter 5, we will be saved. That's future. And so salvation is both a point in time and a process over time. We see this in Philippians 2, in uh, chapter 3, several verses down. The Apostle Paul writes this, I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Both past as well as present. So we don't work for our salvation, but having accepted God's offer of salvation in the past, we continue to work out our salvation in the here and now, even unto the future. And so when we work out our salvation, we do so with the right attitude, the attitude of fear and trembling. Now this phrase doesn't refer to uh, being worried or being anxious or, or terrified in any way. This doesn't mean that we should be concerned, oh, if I, I don't work hard enough, I may lose my salvation. That's not the point of this phrase. Fear and trembling is not about anxiety, but about awe. It's about reverence, it's about respect, it's about honour. It means that we don't take God's gifts of salvation lightly. It, don't, it means we don't think, oh, hallelujah, I've got a, a passport to heaven. Now I can just do whatever I want in my life and oh, God will forgive all my sins in the end anyway. That's a rather smug, a rather complacent way of thinking. And that is not the case. Instead, we come with awe, with reverence at God's grace. We come with respect and honour. We come with amazement that God is working in us. God works. Therefore, we must work. Finally, how do we work out? I come back to these two pictures again, which you saw at the start. The fact is we do actually have to exercise. Just as physical exercises help to strengthen our bodies, God has gifted to us spiritual exercises to strengthen our souls. I don't know about you, but maybe some of you in, in, in the sanctuary, some of you at Shine Forth, you are actually spending money on physical fitness. Maybe you sign up for uh, gym memberships. Maybe you have a personal trainer. Maybe you pay money to go for fitness classes. We all have our favorite sports, right? Some of you play football, tennis, squash. Maybe many of you play golf. Children, I don't know about you children, uh, what is your favourite physical activity? Uh, I remember when I was a child, my two favourite activities used to be freeze catching and Pepsi Cola 1, 2, 3. Kids, do you all still play these kind of games these days? Parents? Yeah, some of you, I see a thumbs up. Yeah, some of you do. Whatever it is, right, whether we are young or whether we are old, we do take part in physical activity. We try to keep ourselves healthy. We try to keep ourselves fit. We invest time. We invest money in our physical health. Do we make the same kind of investments in our spiritual health for our spiritual fitness? What are these spiritual exercises? They are essentially what John Wesley terms as means of grace. You can read more about them in these sermons. I've referenced them on the slide, Sermon 16, Sermon 92. These spiritual exercises, these means of grace, they are really uh, channels, they are really instruments, they are a conduits by which God's grace can flow into us. I want to say once again, as we engage in spiritual exercises, uh, we're not trying to uh, earn grace or trying to earn salvation as we do these exercises. But rather, these exercises allow us to open ourselves up to receive God's grace flowing through these exercises into our lives. One of the key means of grace is engaging with God's Word. Notice I said engaging. Yes, we read God's Word. Some of us listen to God's Word. Maybe you use uh, audio Bibles. Reading, listening, these are obviously the first step. But engaging, engaging also means reflecting on God's Word, contemplating God's Word. 
Asking God to show us how we can apply His Word into our everyday living. Many of us have been doing this already uh, with our CE, uh, our Connect experience. We have the daily devotions and we follow the four R's, read, reflect, relate, and rest. So for those of you who have been doing this, I encourage you, please keep it up. Please continue doing this. You can do it on your own even after the Connect experience concludes. But really, I want to say this. When we engage God's Word, it's really fundamentally because God wants to speak to us. I want to say, God wants to speak to all of you. God is already speaking to you. It's there in His Word. The question is, are we listening? Are we going to His Word, reading, listening, engaging with God's Word? God wants to speak. God is speaking. May we turn our hearts to hear from God through His Word. Some other means of grace, things like prayer, talking with God, things like fasting, uh, supporting, strengthening one another in our connect groups, caring for the sick, caring for the needy, even stewarding our gifts. This could mean uh, using our gifts to serve others. It could mean pledging our energy, pledging our time, pledging our finances so that we can use these things, these gifts that God has given us to be a blessing to others around us. Of course, Pastor Wendy spoke at length about stewardship in her last sermon last week. And later on, we will have an opportunity for us to submit our pledges unto the Lord. But really, all of these, all these images that you've seen on the screen that I've described, these are all spiritual exercises. These are all means of grace through which God's grace can flow into our lives. And so just as we invest in our physical health, may we also invest in our spiritual health. And may our investment not just be once off. May our investment be habitual. Those of you who do uh, financial investments, you know that uh, it's very hard to time the market and that's why people uh, recommend value averaging plans. Yeah, those of you who do investments, you are aware of this. And it's the same principle spiritually. We need to be consistent. We need to be habitual with our spiritual investments also. You know, there are many best-selling books that remind us of the power of habit. Some of you will have read some or maybe all of these books. Habits are important. And habits are powerful spiritually also. Let's hear again what James Smith has to say. He says, If you are what you love and love is a virtue, then love is a habit. This means that our most fundamental orientation to the world, the longings and desires that orient us towards some version of the good life, is shaped and configured by imitation and practice. This has important implications for how we approach Christian formation and discipleship. Habits are powerful. Our longings, our desires, our wants, they too are shaped by repeated practice. So, how are our souls being shaped? A prospering soul is a soul that wants what God wants. What is it that we are wanting? What is it that we are working for? What we really want, that we will do. And so will we allow God to shape our wants through repeated practice, through habitual, habitual use of God's means of grace? Will we work out regularly using these spiritual exercises? Will we make these habitual investments and so allow God to reshape our desires, to reorient our longings, to realign our wants towards God's good pleasure. As I draw to a close, one final means of grace. John Wesley mentions this often, Holy Communion. As we share in Holy Communion, we are not just communing with God. We're also communing with one another. We are brothers and sisters, one family, sharing at the same table of the Lord. And this really ties in with our scripture text. You can see the highlighted words on the screen. These are all in the plural, not the singular. Okay, it's a bit hard to see in the English, but in the original Greek, these are all plural. So the Bible is speaking not just to us as individuals, but speaking all of us together. We have to work out in communion. We have to work out 
together, not alone. And that's what we've been really trying to encourage, trying to help all of us do in this time of our CE, our Connect experience. And so later on, as we come and share in Holy Communion, this means of grace, let's come to the Lord's table with thankfulness. Let's come assured that God is indeed working. He is working in us. That's amazing. And He is working all for His good pleasure. As we come to Holy Communion, let's draw near with awe and reverence for God is the one enabling us to work, to do, to act. Let's draw near asking God to renew our wants, to reorder our longings, to redirect our desires. Let's draw near as one people of God working out our salvation together. Together investing in spiritual habits, engaging in spiritual exercises, together joining in the means of grace so that all of our souls, together as one family, all of our souls may indeed prosper. May this be our desire. May this be our prayer. In the name of Christ, amen.